I'd like to call the meeting to order at 5.03 p.m. And we're on Zoom. Do we have any... Um, Christine? No Ooh. resident participation. No resident participation. Although Lorelei did submit um, the notes for the RAC board, so we'll look at those. That's our resident advisory communication committee. Okay. So the first order of business, besides being called to order at 503, is to review the minutes from the meeting of April 26th. And you should have them in your packet. You are here a motion to approve the minutes. I are do. There Go ahead. Thank you, Liz. Second? I'll second it. Thank you, Donna. Are there any corrections that need to be made? No. Hearing none. I didn't see anything. Are you ready for the vote? Yep. Aye. Okay, if you will approve the minutes as circulated. Aye. No. No abstentions. They are approved. <laughs> um, No resident and citizen participation. We don't have to worry about that right now. Um, the COVID-19 update, please, Christine. I did. I just submitted um, with my packet just uh, the an email to the staff. Um, you know, I do a weekly email to the staff, but this one was more important than normal, just because so many things have changed. Um, as you know, the governor has um, said that there doesn't need to be a mask mandate. However, before the town had said that they were continuing, we we said that we were continuing. We've we have uh, been aligning ourselves with either the state or the town, depending on who has the stricter guidelines. Um, but primarily we've been utilizing the town as our as our sort of gauge and so we've done that with everything we've offered whether it's programming um, community spaces you know protocol so we've really continued to do that aligning so we are continuing to say to all staff whether they're vaccinated or not they need to wear masks when they're at work the same rules and we're asking our residents to do the same to follow the same protocols for the time being and I noticed when I was in there this morning to sign checks that there's still a temperature check so that you know it's very helpful to follow a con contacts. Okay. Yes, and the only thing that has changed is we were, we used to make staff make tell us when they were coming into the office. They don't have to do that anymore. People are allowed to come in whenever they want staff wise. Mm -hmm. However, they have to still sign in. And um, we have been offered the opportunity to have a vaccine clinic at one of our sites. However, when we did a survey, we only have five people sign up. And so they won't do it for such a small amount, but we will, um, the, I talked to the Department of Health today and they said that they're, they're getting to the point where they're going to be able to do clinics for 10 or less. So we're gonna take them up on that offer. Great. Okay. Number six, operations update on open staff positions. We are currently, we have jobs posted for the family self-sufficiency position and for the SASH nurse position. We're really struggling with the SASH nurse position. However, we have a nurse who is working with us from Valley Care. She's the SASH nurse there. Mm -hmm. And she has been working with us throughout this whole time. She actually helped us a little bit before Jenna left um, during COVID. So she's continuing. She said that she could at least continue through the summer. So we're, we're, we're feeling confident with that. That's good, but we're gonna keep trying. We reached out to the hospital to have a partnership, but they're just not in the position to do that at this time. So we're reaching out to Bet, Bayada and BNA again to see if possibly that could be a, a way to collaborate. But we're continuing to look. Um, for the FSS position, we have been interviewing. We had five pretty good candidates and we're interviewing. So we're, we're in that process of the first round of interviews. So that's great. And we brought in Amy, who had been helping us throughout COVID. She has a full-time job, but she's been helping us part-time. And we increased her hours and she's helping us um, doing some admin work, additional admin work and support around um, in the accounting department. And so we're, we're trying to fill the FSS program before we hire for the next job. We don't, you know, we don't want to have too many things out there at once. Mm -hmm. Any questions, commissioners? Any progress on the VISTA 
very soon? No, not at all. We have had absolutely no luck. We have we have gone to colleges. We have reached out to, we've reached out everywhere. Lorelei has done a really great job at spreading the word and we have had no luck at all. Not one person. Um, I hear several VISTA positions um, being announced at um, Hunger Council and Sue Graff sends out a, a like an email um, to many organizations. Was Lorelai able to make an announcement there? She made an announcement through oh. the graphs mailing list, yes. Cool. Okay. Yeah. She actually, I think, was the first person that did it. And then there was more that came afterwards. But it looks like a lot of people are looking. And we're just not getting any, um, we're not getting anybody to apply. And so I, th I think the next, I really want her to push at some of the universities. I'm hoping that maybe when college students are coming home, like graduating and they're back here, they might say, you know, this might not be a bad idea. I think that the job market right now is so, there's so many positions available that I just, I don't, you know, I think when I did it, when I was younger, I think it was different. I think people, I had less options and I think that there's a lot of options right now. You've been running some good ads for all those positions. We have, yeah. And I think the fact that we're getting we're getting interest in the FSS position means that people are there are people looking. It's that but I think that it might be hard right now for that Vista position. But we'll keep trying. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that when kids kids are just starting to graduate college. Mm -hmm. You know, so that might be something when they come home, their parents might say, like, nudge nudge, this is a good opportunity. <laughs> But, it, you know, it could be someone else or someone who's changing careers or someone who's retired. It could be a lot of different things. So we're open. We're open to any, any possibility. Okay. Are we move, ready to move on to City Review and Property Managers Report? Uh, Green. Courtney and Jen. I had a question on um, A.W. Richards, no, the, the, the Hayes Court. On the right-hand side, um, it says W slash L. What does that mean? Uh, just hold on one second. You know, I think I asked this a lot. I always forget, um, and I remember this less. It's... Um, You know, I just, it'll come to me if I think of it. I can't think, I know it's not an in-house transfer. It's not deceased. Um, okay, no worries. Yeah, I'm trying to think of it. Oh, left with voucher. So they left with, um, they left with a, with one of our section eight vouchers. Oh, okay. And they went to a different housing. Did they move to another community? Um, I don't know. I know one of them moved locally. Mm -hmm. for sure. That's what jarred my memory when I looked at what it was. I know one of them moved locally. It was a bigger, they needed a different type of housing. Um, and then the other one, I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's okay. Just had, having somewhat discovered some time ago that the section vouchers go with the client so that they might indeed move to another community entirely. Mm -hmm. Anything more? Are we showing any increase in um, payment of rent, of rent? Well, I think that you saw what we submitted um, to, we gave to all of our residents um, around the emergency rental assistance program. So hopefully we'll have some people apply for that. Um, we, we, have a, we have a meeting this Wednesday with our attorney to see what our next steps are for a plan for going forward. We have some people with some pretty large balances. Mm -hmm. And so coming up with a real plan for um, what that looks like once the eviction moratorium ends. Mm -hmm. And so talking to her about, um, she has a 
really good understanding of what legal aid would expect. I'm, I'm assuming they're going to expect uh, repayment agreements. Um, it would be great if we could get some of these balances paid down with the um, emergency rental assistance funds. If that's if, if they're eligible, that would be the best case scenario. Repayment agreements are tough. If people have a hard time paying their rent, they're going to have a hard time paying their rent plus more money. So it kind of sets them up to fail. But but, you know, we want to keep people housed. We understand this is a difficult time. So we're we're working together, Courtney and I and the attorney to really come up with a plan that makes the most sense. Our staff has been trained to work with people with the rental assistance program. They have been they have committed so many hours to this. It's it's amazing to me how much time and energy and, and the communication that they've put out. And so if our if our residents qualify, I think that there's a pretty good chance that they'll apply. Mm -hmm. We have staff to support them. We, we have ways of getting them in touch with other people. So I think that would be great. If they don't qualify, I think then we would, I think we really are going to need to have to have some, you know, difficult conversations um, in the next couple of months as a board of, of what we want that plan to look like going forward. Better to be prepared for it. At this point. But the good thing the good news is, is having our attorney, um, she's really, she, she works with so many other housing organizations. I think we should align with what other, everyone else is doing. You know, I don't think we're going to go off on our own and come up with a unique plan. No, well, that's what you told us last month when you introduced <laughs> the new attorney was that she had, had, she'd worked with a lot of housing authorities and so forth, has a, a good sense of what's happening uh, from our colleagues. Um, resident wellness and services and SASH coordinators. Floralize blue. I think it's great that they're going to help people just in small numbers start communicating in the, um, mm -hmm. the room, the um, community room, mm -hmm. and hopefully that can grow into some social activities as the COVID uh, laws open up and stuff like that. But I'm sure people would be very grateful to be able to sit down inside if it's a real hot day to visit with their neighbor. I don't find it at the moment. But I remember reading that at one point, watching television was not considered one of the welcome activities in the community room. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask a question about that. I think that we're just waiting, you know, it was, this is the first step. And so we knew that if we had had the TVs back on, it would be really hard to maintain four person at a time. And so I think we're just seeing how it goes. I mean, a big nice thing about it is those spaces are air conditioned. Last summer, you know, we couldn't, we, nothing was open. The libraries were closed, everything was closed. So if people didn't have air conditioning in their apartments, it could be really hard to get relief. And so we really wanted to open it specifically for that, for people to get a break. And I think over time we will, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, things are moving very quickly. If the governor, if, if the governor's emergency, um, proclamation changes, we're going to change pretty fast as well. Good. Any more questions? I wondered, I wondered if you were anywhere on uh, funding for a parade ground at Ledgewood. We put in a grant application, um, but we but we haven't heard back yet. Um, so we've been exploring some options of how to fund for that. Um, I think that we also would like to bring the community together to see what they would like from a playground. We also put in an application to have more of a bike path at Ledgewood to like on, on the back part to do a little bike path. Um, so we're we're looking at that as well, and and so we really want to be able to bring the kids together, I'm hopeful this summer, and parents to say, well, what do you want out of this playground? What is needed? Some people say they want some, you know, we have the little kids stuff still, but we don't have, a lot of kids feel like there needs to be something for sort of tweens, you know, younger, not teen teenagers, but a little bit like older, older kids, you know, kids in middle school. 
at least until recently, um, you're probably aware Home Depot was providing grants and assistance with playground projects. No, I didn't know that. Nope. It would be worth checking. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely check that out. And um, I asked Lorelai to reach out to the town because the town did get, I think, a community block grant to, um, to redo some of their playgrounds. I think the one on um, South Main Street and the one on Pine, not Pine, is it Pine? Yeah, Pine. Pine. The small one. <laughs> and so, I'm, you know, I, I asked Lorelai to reach out and see, you know, what that looked like and how, what the process, how she they applied and, and things like that. So it might be interesting to see, to maybe piggyback off of some of the work that they did as well. And I just wondered, where, where are the gardens? So there are gardens at Ledgewood that are down by, like, if you were to drive all the way through Ledgewood and you get to the, um, kind of, and you take a left, at the, yeah. at the last place you can take a left, they're down at the bottom there. And that would be like close to where the bike path would be as well. And then the gardens at, Hay, at Hayes Court are all behind the buildings. There's various garden plots. Oh, great. The Moore Court is along, like there's a um, fenced in area, like along <coughs> when you first come in on the right. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, what was that? We have gardens at Red Clover. At Red Clover, we have gardens in the back as well. Really? Yeah. Great. I spoke to uh, Lorelai today because I'm going to a training on Thursday from um, AARP. It's a placemaking uh, training on infrastructure to increase physical activity. Um, and it's like low, um, low expense uh, projects. So I told her about it and I told her if I see anything that would be great for that area to let her know. So that will be on Thursday and I'll, I will follow up with her. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, thank you very much. The more e eyes and ears we have, the better. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll take any resources. Mm -hmm. How about moving on to SASH, the implementation from Donna Jones? It was fascinated to see that it has expanded to Marlboro and it's helping uh, a friend of mine who I'm delighted to say. Yes, that's the um, panel up at Valley Cares um, has expanded. They've expanded a lot, which is great. They cover a very wide geographical area. Which again is a reminder that all those sash started at the housing developments it really has moved out into the community in a good way. Absolutely, yes, yep. Um, what are gonna be um, the precautions for the bone builders class that's starting at Hayes Court. Um, just mask. I'm sorry, what was that question? <laughs> sorry. Or it says that the bone builders is going to start at Hayes Court in beginning of June. Um, will they be wearing masks? Um, they will be at, at this point. No. Right. We're requiring all people to wear masks. I think unless that changes. You is know. there any other precautions um, along with that? Yeah, I mean, everything that we're doing, like we're we're having hand sanitizer, we're spacing people six feet apart. Um, I think with people being outside, I think the, the thought is, is that it's as low risk as we can, we can get. Um, I think we will allow people to use the bathroom. So we'll probably do some, you know, we've been doing extra disinfecting this whole time. So hopefully at that point, you know, we'll, we'll continue that until we sort of get better guidance. Okay. They'll have to wipe everything down. That's going to be a big piece at the end. Yeah, not sharing um, weights. Weights and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's exciting that that's starting again. Yeah, I think so. That'll be really good. I think that they probably really missed it. That was such, it's such a popular program. So um, the resident advisory and communication committee, RAC, does that remember? I think you called it? Yes. How is that going? Good. I think that it's it's been good. We have, um, you know, I don't, they had their meeting today. So these are notes from last month. Um, they meet the same day as we do every month, the fourth Monday of the month. And so, you know, I think that they're, it's good. I mean, there we don't always get, as you can see, you know, we didn't have any members from Hayes Court. Um, I think we only had members from Ledgewood and Moorcourt last month. And so we're still looking to recruit people from the other housing sites. It sort of ebbs and flows. And we had really good crowds when we used to meet in person. And because we used to do lunch, like we would have, we would do it over lunchtime and we would serve, we would get like takeout, we would get like sandwiches from Subway. And I feel like it just felt very communal. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little difficult on Zoom. I don't think there's as much motivation to want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, I think Lorelai tries her best, but I think she's struggling to get people there. I think they would like to meet in person. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you covered a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. They did, they talked a lot, they, they, they went over a lot of stuff. So they, they do a lot in those meetings for sure. Um, they're doing a lot of focusing on programming, like things that they wanna see. We talked about the potential for the SASH for All program, which I, I talked to them a little bit about that. Um, they were talking about things that they wanted on their, at their site, like events that they would wanna do, which was really helpful. That gives us a good idea of like, how, do, how we wanna go forward for the summer. Um, Last summer, we bought swim passes. Um, and, well, we basically, we had an account at the pool and we said that people could go and they would just have to sign out and we would pay for them to go in. And that worked out really well. And I think we'll do the same thing. You know, I think we capped it at a certain few hundred dollars. Um, and then I think we met it and then we just said, okay, well, we'll do a little bit more. And so it was great. I think people were more likely to go. Um. I don't know if you know about this, but there's this uh, um, townwide, Wyndham countywide incentive program called the Come Alive Outside Passport. So if they go to different places in the community, they can earn points and prizes. Um, and the pool is one of them. So I can send all that information to Lorelai. So it gives them a little bit more incentive to go. Yeah, absolutely. I've looked at those and those look great. So that would be, I remember seeing it a while ago, maybe it was like before COVID. So that would be great. Um, I think she would really like that. And I think our families would too. I think it's a neat thing because you just kind of run out of ideas. You forget, you know, it's hard to think of stuff to do sometimes. It's great. What's it called again, Alicia? I'm just going to write it down. It's the Come Alive Outside Passport presented by Rise Vermont. We did one in the fall of 2019, but we're doing another one um, that started last week, and it goes until the end of September. That's great. Great. Liz, I know you enjoy Sash Flash, and particularly the recipes on the back. Yeah. So, yeah. Comment on that. Yes, it sounds delicious. I need to watch my calories here, but on the other hand, the, the nutritious flavors are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of vegetables. And Absolutely. Well, it was well done. You know, just, I, I really appreciate that you know, everybody being educated with good recipes through the Sash Flash. I think that's terrific. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite part. <laughs> Great. Well, in the middle, is also the discussion about the walking club that's back. Yes, I thought that was great. Okay. I also liked the, the full page about mental health awareness mm -hmm. um, being May, mental health awareness um, month, but giving all these different tips for taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. really. and as we are learning, 
set small goals, but build on them. Okay. Okay. The um, Section 8 housing choice voucher programs, shelter plus care, and transitions to housing. It's such a awfully hard hunt for yes. apartments. Mm -hmm. I think as David has said it, it's profoundly challenging. Well, the, the folks who don't want to move into uh, Red Clover too, you know, but they probably must because there's no place else to go. My heart goes out to them, um, but at least it's a roof over their head. And, um, you know, it's just, it's amazing how tight housing is. It is, yeah, it is, um, it is extremely tight. And um, we have seen more residents decide to go to Red Clover Commons, so. Yeah. And so, yeah, we have, we've had a little bit of luck. We might I think we have one person who will be moving into an apartment locally. They did find an apartment and someone else is looking out of town and they're having, I think they might have some good luck, but the rest will either move to either Sam Elliott or Hayes or to RCC. And how are we doing as far as the mainstream voucher? Um, so, you know, I think it, I think David had said that we're, our goal is to lease 20 <laughs> by year's end. I think that's very optimistic. I hope that that happens. Um, they have been, you know, we, we've transitioned. So we really transition people off of the shelter plus care program and then transition them onto the mainstream voucher program. And so they still have a voucher, but they don't have that, they don't have that permanent supported housing. Um, they don't have that support that they had. And that's okay because most of the people that we've transitioned had really, they didn't need it anymore. They'd had it for a long time. They'd been on the program. So it was a way for us to open up some spaces for shelter plus care. And so I think it's working well. I'm glad we did it. I think it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's happening. It's just, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not like we just get 40 vouchers and they're off in the community and we're housing them. It's, there's nothing available. So we're, we're sort of transitioning off. And then some of the people that are coming into shelter plus care, you know, we might be able to find them some, some a different type of housing, like a, maybe, you know, uh, you know, a single occupancy unit at Windham Windsor, or it might be easier to find them some of the units that, that we probably wouldn't find with a straight voucher, with a regular Section 8 voucher. So I think that David, you know, I think at first it was a little like, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to take on more vouchers. But I think when David really thought about it, he came up with this plan that was very smart because it was really making space for the people that needed it and, and keeping the people who don't need that support on a voucher. So they didn't lose anything. And so what it was very clever. It was, it was a good way of very deliberate. It was good. And part of the quote support was the mental health support. Uh, that many, I've worked with a few people who are uh, housing um, shelter plus care, who really have adapted and uh, are no longer mentally homeless. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference. Yeah, and they might have a toolkit available now that they didn't have otherwise. And so now they can move on without it. And, and, and we have so many resources in the community that they can still reach out. It's, you know, they don't lose everything. <laughs> There's still resources. It's just some of the people moving on to the program need a lot of support for those initial year or two. So, so we want to give them the space for that. Okay. The Pathways to Housing, uh, housing Vermont as a program sponsor, which will begin August 1st. Is there anything more that we need to know about that? No, other than... Um, David and I met with Pathways and um, some of the people from Pathways and we had a great conversation. We met with them twice. We talked about what we needed from a program. They talked about what they could provide, which is just support for, for two or so people at a time. But it's, it's wonderful because it adds another group to our repertoire of, of, 
of case management. And, you know, right now with, you know, with Groundworks, they're, they have a lot in their plate. And so we, it, it was time for sure to bring in another organization and Pathways, I think has really come a long way in the last, you know, few years. And I think they're doing a great job. So I think it was a, it was a good time to start to partnership with them. And the financial review, monthly Texas listing. I'd be glad to take July since I'm fully able to take one in June. Okay. So I'm finishing up May. And would you prefer just July and have somebody else do June? Or no, no. Liz was gonna do Liz was gonna do the first two weeks, but it sounds like she can only do the second week. Yeah. No. I could only do the first week. Okay. And uh, because I've got that doctor's appointment. On That's, that. right. That's yeah. right. And, um, and then um, um, Alicia's going to do the second week. Yeah. As long as everything's all good. Yeah, I think it should be. I haven't, he's on vacation until tomorrow, so I should hear back from him tomorrow. I sent him an email. Um, but usually that's very quick. And then, um, and then Byron, you are able to do the last two weeks of June? Yes. Okay. So I'd be glad to pitch in July. I'm home all week, month. There's no problem. Okay. Can you me down for August, Christine? Do you want to do that, Donna? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. And I can do September. Okay. Great. That's all I need for now. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, summer went very fast. With I know. <laughs> well done before we start. <laughs> um, the board review. Uh, well, are there any questions about the checklist? No. Um, board review of comparables. It's a test on this on our eyesight. Yes, <laughs> I apologize. It is small. I don't. There's no other better way to do it. Unfortunately, it's. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And the numbers that we are most interested in are in bold anyway, so it makes it easier to read them. Anything yeah. that stands out for you, Christine, that you want to point out to us? You know, I think just, uh, you know, I was hoping to have the year end close. He's still working on it. I think he has like the last thing he needed for today. So I was hoping to get it to you. Um, you know, I think it's hard sometimes until we get that year end close to know because there's some things that might get paid. You know, I, like I was noticing just sort of our, some of our utilities that, you know, they didn't, they didn't get paid in January. They got more got paid in February. So you really see the difference. Um, but overall, you know, I think we were considering, you know, COVID and that things, mm -hmm. it was the first year we were with James. So we sort of like put a budget together without, we were basing it on history, but we didn't know for sure. It was the first time we were doing it together. I think we, we did really well. I think we're on target. I think when we built the budget for next, you know, when we built the budget going forward, we, we really knew where to allocate differently. We, we moved some things around. So um, overall, I think we're doing well financially. I don't, you know, I think we're, we have a lot of money. I mean, I should say that we have money in savings. We're able to meet all the reserves. You know, we haven't, we, we could be taking money out of our reserves to pay for some of the work that we did last year, but we didn't. And so we took that out. So we, we were able to keep all of our reserves in. We haven't allocated anything to those. So that is, I feel like makes me feel better. You know, that was sort of a goal of ours to see what we could do before we started to withdraw any of our reserves. Um, so when we did those capital improvements, we didn't, we didn't take them out of reserves, which is great. And so, you know, it's, we're new to RAD. So, so I think that was the first year of seeing. So when we went in, we sort of wanted to see if that was something that we could do. Um, and, and I think we were fine. I think, you know, we've added some positions, you know, we added the maintenance supervisor, um, which was a big expense, but now with Jack's position gone, that will offset it a little bit, but we'll be looking to hire someone. So, you know, it's sort of that in-between piece. 
But you're also using this as an opportunity to rebalance. Where yeah. Yeah. I'm just remembering the dirty old days when we were still under HUD and they could literally crawl, claw back some of our savings and reserves. So it's nice that uh, we're <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I think in the past, you know, we were always trying to figure out how to utilize the capital fund. You know, we needed these big projects done, but the capital fund, you had to spend in very specific ways. And so you'd have to save several years. And so I think going around makes it a lot easier to plan. I think that our expenses are weird because everything is just, you know, we're comparing expenses and things that cost one thing a year ago to cost a totally different thing. So it's a little bit hard to budget. I'm hoping that by the end of this fiscal year, that will even out a little bit. I think things are just a little topsy-turvy still. Yeah, and the price of lumber and things like that, that would affect us, yes. have really gone up. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, there's definitely, and it's harder to get some parts, it's harder to get some things, so I've heard that. Um, we've been pretty lucky, we've, you know, we have a little stockpile of refrigerators and things like that, so, you know, we're trying to stay up on all those things, but you're right, Donna, they're, the cost of some things have just gone through the roof. Lumber is definitely one of them. I mean, our lumber cost when we, for RCC2, went up considerably, you know, right away we, got, we took a big hit. So we've come around since then, but initially we, were, we took a big hit right from the beginning. So large project, projects in progress, exactly where we are. Um, so I think Chris's report's on yellow. So yes, our construction's at a good pace. We should have the certificate of occupancy by August 1st. Um, we're hoping to move people in the end of August through October. Primarily, most people will be moved in September. That is our goal. We have much more staff available. <laughs> I mean, as you can imagine, some of our staff actually want to go on vacation this summer. I don't you know. I can't believe I so surprising. <laughs> so um, so working around the schedules, it'll be better to move most people in September for sure. So it, it's 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 a good thing that 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 it will be then um, we. Um, David continues to work with, you know, we're doing a lot of work with re relocation. We have already moved one resident to SEA and that went really well. So that's good. Um, David's continuing to work with people on, on that part on his end to see if we can find um, housing. Um, we are just finishing um, work on our CBDG, uh, CDBG application for funding. So those that was the application we put in. Um, a while ago through the town to get additional funding to pay for some of our expenses that weren't covered under HUD, um, primarily our uh, hazard pay costs and any COVID related expenses for disinfecting, which was by far our bus biggest expense. We have a private contract for uh, a company to do that. We did. We did. We had somebody come in from the outside. We couldn't cover all the sites continuously every day the way we needed to in-house. How are we doing in getting ready for the FEMA project at Melrose? Um, we're doing well. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that it's, I saw them walking around today so that we're, you know, I saw the contractors walking around. So they must be putting the bids, you know, I think that the, the engineers and the contractors are out. Um, I think that we're, we're, you know, we're planning on starting in July, depending on what we get um, for bids. So we're hoping to move forward. There's a lot of pieces in place. So we have, um, we have someone in charge of the project. We also, Chris is working on it. We also have, um, you know, the FEMA group is working on it. So everything, everything is right on course. So it will be really finding the right engineer, right, the right contractor. And the uh, moving to work, for instance, not AKA, not for instance, Brattleboro housing opportunities. The uh, timeline that we saw in our March packet that we have back here, the, the timeline. I think this is really helpful because you can see it all, you mm -hmm. know, in one space. 
Yeah, and so I shared a little bit about this with Janet early on, but we actually, um, so, so there's a lot of pieces that need to go into place in the planning of this. And we worked really hard on the application. I mean, it took a lot of energy and time and a lot of uh, work power. So I know that when we go forward, we're going to, we're going to really need a, some, a real, as I would say, a map, a roadmap um, to get to where we need to be. And so I have been thinking about this, like, how are we going to do this? And so um, Jeanette really knows this process very well. I mean, she really understands moving to work because she helped us. So she's going to help us over the summer to create a really good timeline, like road map for the organization, which will include who needs to be trained for what, you know, what jobs are going to change? What would, what would the job descriptions look like? What do we need to bring in from outside? What will we be able to do internally? And I think that's going to be a big help because I've been doing a lot of it on my own, but I just don't have the capacity to do enough. We need to bring someone else in. And she has a great relationship with the Keen State Housing, who is already moving to work. She knows the program really well. She understands a lot of the pieces. And so she won't be developing any of the programs at all. It, that will all come from us, but she will be helping us to figure out sort of how to get where we want to be. And I think that will be helpful for the board. And she's going to continue to do that over the next few months with the understanding. I really was hoping that we would um, sign the agreement to begin at the end of August, beginning of September, because that would also align with our strategic planning. And so that we could do the strategic planning with the moving to work planning. So we're not doing two different strategic plan, you know, two different plans. We're really, we'd be combining it. Mm -hmm. I know that there was concern that this seemed very governmental, which of course it has to be, but her role as the head of the government operations uh, in the state Senate certainly means that she knows how to allow for the administrative needs of government and what we need. And she also knows a lot more, you know, it's been hard for me to keep track of all the different funding and everything. And she can really be, a, she's a good resource for that to say, you know, this is where we should really be looking or this is where you should look next or this is what we should be applying for. I think that's very, that's going to be helpful too. So when we met, that was that was on her short list as well. So the biggest job by far is this moving to work. We have some policy things, not that she'd be writing policy, she just needs to edit some of the policy changes that I've been sort of working on and then we would present them to the board. So that was the second project. But the biggest thing by far is the, is the moving to work and it would be laying sort of coming up with a plan, reviewing all of the HUD trainings, and then coming up with a plan and a, a really good timeline, and then what needs to be done when and by whom. And if there's any internal changes that we need, then we'll be able to figure out how we're going to do those things. And that way we're not, we're not just winging it. <laughs> I mean, not that we would ever just wing it, but, you know, it, I think that that's what we really need. Somebody, you know, she said, oh, I really appreciate this because I've been making so much, this is like, I don't have to make any decisions. You know, she's not going to be deciding anything. She's just going to be creating um, sort of basically like learning about the program so that she can teach us. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. I'm excited about it. And, and it's a big weight off of my shoulders. Wonderful. Well, she has worked with Brattleboro Housing for many, many years in the kind of off time when the legislature yeah. is in session. So it can be, it has been helpful over many years. The timeline of signing the resolution. So if you have any questions, so I, I apologize. I don't know how this, I had sent this out in March and then I, it didn't make it into the packet. So I apologize. Um, I did send it to you again. I will mail it to you so you have a hard copy. Um, but if you have any questions about the, the ACC contract, so the annual contributions contract is basically, I'll give you a very synop a quick synopsis. <laughs> so we have an ACC agreement with HUD, you know, it's to be a public housing organization. This will change, it will, be, it will basically say in this agreement, and I can break it down by paragraphs, but that video that I sent you really does break it down really well. It goes through every section and explains it. It basically says that we're changing from what we were to 
public housing, I mean, to moving to work. And under moving to work, we're eligible to accept different vouchers, um, waivers, I'm sorry, different waivers. So we can change, we can amend the way we do things in some places. There are some things we can never waive, like we can never not serve people who are low income. That is our job, right? We're, we can't change that. We can never waive fair housing. You know, we always have to be fair the way we house people. So we can't waive, but we could maybe waive some things. Like we could maybe, there's waivers for the FSS program and there's waivers around certification process. There's lots of waivers that we could apply for, but it wouldn't change the fundamentals of Brattleboro Housing Partnerships. It would just allow us some of the flexibility of how we do things. Great. And so this contract is basically a contract between us and HUD and HUD has been on me to sign it. They are like, when are you going to sign it? And I said, well, we're going to wait. We have this big project and they understand that. So they know that we're, you know, that a board is waiting. We're probably going to sign it in August. They will see it around then um, if, if the board decides to do so. But, um, but it's really a document to say, you know, these are the rules, you know, we need to follow these rules. And if we don't follow them, HUD could say, well, then you're no longer, we're gonna, we're gonna punish you. We're gonna take this away. But HUD can do that under our ACC now. We have to follow HUD regulations regardless. So if we have this amendment or somebody else, I mean, we, we are obligated to follow the HUD rules all the time. This is just saying that we have to follow these specific rules under the moving to work program. It, forgive me did I, if I missed something of why we're waiting till August to sign it. Because as soon as we wait, as soon as we sign it, it's like basically like it, it's triggers like you got to go. So as soon as you sign it, you need to start doing X, Y, and Z right away. And we're just, and we had talked a couple months about saying like, we're not going to be ready. You know, we're, we're relocating people. We have a building coming online. Our staff is just not. Yeah. So you were, yeah, that's, the, that's the long, long answer. Nope. It's an important answer that mm -hmm. when we do sign it, then we want to be ready to go on the beginning of, of Brattleboro housing opportunities. Right. And that's why I think it's important for us to, it was really important for us to bring someone in who could help us with this. And I can't think of anyone, you know, I really can't think of anyone better who knows our organization, knows the population we serve, knows our community and knows moving to work. And I, so I think we have the right fit for that. And has the capacity to do it, <laughs> you know. Yep. I could have asked Chris Hart to do one more thing. Believe me. The fact that the legislature just is adjourned is just great for us. She was here at ten o'clock this morning. <laughs> no. Was she? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no. um, the board and commissioners' business the strategic planning update on submissions, and we want to look at the waiver listing. Yes, so I have received as of today, one official submission for our um, for our strategic <laughs> planning. The good news is it's someone who's great <laughs> and is local and knows us. Um, and one other person who has done strategic planning for another big orga housing organization has reached out to me and I think she wants to put one in as well, but she wanted to meet with me first. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet with her, but we have one formal proposal um, and I haven't even looked at it. It came in today. I think the deadline was today. So um, so I got it today and I'll, I'll look at it and then I'll see if, if somebody else wants to put it in, I'll probably, because we only get received one, I would probably extend it, but we'll see. Do we have a minimum? that we want to attain if possible? You know, I think that's up to you. I mean, we don't have to have a minimum um, to go forward. I think that once we see the proposal, I'll send it out to you. I'll review it today and I can send it out via, via email and you as a board can decide and you can decide at the next meeting whether you think you want, if we get more, we can certainly submit them to you or you can decide whether you wanna go forward with this. Any comments? Then the next waiver listing. So a few months ago, um, when right after COVID, so HUD um, 
HUD allowed us to um, have certain waivers um, to how we do business and we had presented them to the board, the board approved them. Um, and I wanted to just, this came to me after I sent the board packet. So I just wanted to review with the board the waivers that we would like to continue to accept. I don't need a board approval, but I would love to have one <laughs> and to document going forward so that we can just all be on the same page of what the waivers are, the, the HUD waivers that we're going to accept for um, from today. And they will, I think they will end at the end of the calendar year. Um, they might get extended. So I'm gonna read them out loud. And um, after I read each one, I'll have, I'll pause. And if you have questions. So the first one is a family income and composition. So this allows us to waive the requirements to use income hierarchy, including the use of EIV and will allow public housing to consider self-certification as the highest form of income verification. So this allows um, some, residents to for us to not use the EIV as um, the employment income verification. Um, however, we do use it the whole time. <laughs> We've been using it throughout the whole pandemic, but just in case we come into a situation where we can't use it, then this waiver allows us to not use it. All right, and that's usually if we can't get an income verification. Like there are some people who don't send them to us. I'm not gonna name them. There are people in the community, but they're not good at verifying the income of some of their employees. And so this allows us to waive that. So okay. It's the employer who is not sending you the information. Yes, sometimes, yes, yeah. So this would allow us to, to revert back to the EIV and, to, um, and then to have people self-certify. Okay. Um, the next one is also a family income. So this was a, um, this is another family income interim self examination. And this waives a requirement to use the income verification requirements um, for interim re-examination. So this is for like, if we have a recertification that's not, that's more frequently than annually. So another income verification. So if, a, if a, someone comes to us and says, my income change, then if we can't get the information, they can self-assess. Eventually we're gonna get the information, but it gives us that we can, we can go forward with that. So that's the second one. Um, the third is another income verification. It waives the mandatory EIV monitoring requirements. So if we decide that we don't wanna monitor the EIV, we don't have to. Again, we've been doing it primarily the whole time, but just in case we can't, I think David wanted to take that. Um, again, another, the, third, the fourth one is income determination, income verification. This waives the third party income verification requirement for applicants. Um, so this is for applicants, not for current. Residents, so this is the same thing that people would have to self-certify. Um, that and the public housing must review the income um, within 90 days afterwards. So they can self-certify, but within 90 days, we need to verify. Initial inspection. So we've been doing this since COVID started. I think David wants to continue it, especially because it's going to take us a while to catch up. But when we're having, um, we're having people self-certify, landlords self-certify about apartments. So they have to sign off that all of these requirements are met before someone can move in. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is a project-based voucher pre-HAP contract inspection. So again, these are changes to the inspection requirement. They're allowing for self-certification. The public housing must inspect the unit no later than 6-30-2022. Um, and then the, the next one is initial inspection for non-life-threatening deficiencies, allows for expansion of up to 30 days for owner to repair, um, to, to do all repairs of non-life-threatening conditions. So if there's something that we identify that needs to be done, they have 30 days to do it. Is that more than it, than it used to be? I think it used to be that people were supposed to expect it. It's, it was non-life-threatening. I think it was, um, I think, I, 
it allows for extension of up to 30 days. So I don't know exactly how many days they have, but it's uh, it's 30 days on top of whatever they currently have. This is on moving. This is on, yeah, initial expect, inspection of non-life-threatening deficiencies. So in other words, this is a, a dwelling in the community that people are renting through Section 8. Mm -hmm. There are requirements under Section 8 for quality. Yes. Spaces. Yeah. Now, the part of the waiver is to allow more time for correcting the deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think at this point, when people move in, we're allowing people to self-certify, but we need to we need to inspect the unit no later than 6:30. And if they identify that there's something wrong that's non-critical, then we need they need to fix it within a certain amount of time, and they get a 30-day extension. All of these you know changes seem to be um, of assistance to help the flexibility of taking care of people and still verify and still get it all done, but not have a rigid issue so that you could work with people and help move things forward. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, and it takes, you know, so David isn't able to go into the units yet. I mean, he will be eventually, but for right now he's, we're allowing people to self-certify for these sure. units. But our hope is, is that people will be truthful and they will, you know, if, if they're willing to house our residents and they'll be truthful and that will, they'll self-certify correctly because I mean, they're signing off on a HUD, on a federal document. Um, and so we're taking them that, that, that they're self-certifying, but then we will have to inspect by six, mm -hmm. 20, by six thirty twenty two. 22. So David, you know, we haven't decided yet how we're going to move forward, but he will, you know, David has always maintained a schedule that goes throughout the year. So he has 140 units. So he spaces them out over 12 months. We're not going to be able to do 140 units the first month we go back. It's just not going to happen. So it's going to take us time to get back into that cycle. And so this gives him a little bit more flexibility as well to, to focus on the apartments that we're already having and then saying, well, we can, you know, do we need to inspect the Wyndham Windsor unit or can they give us the certification themselves? Right. I mean, they can certify themselves, I think, you know, and, and for the landlords in the community, most of the landlords, you know, they have to fill out this form and, and say that. So you're right, Liz, it's making things easier for people. Um, uh, do, 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 do. So um, the next one is about bi biannual inspection. So this just allows us to wait to um, do the biannual, biannual inspection, the delayed inspection, we should do them as reasonably, as soon as reasonable possible, but no later than 6 2022. So we're basically allowing an additional year to recover from COVID. Yes, yeah. Um, Again, this is this is more. It, it's just more inter. There's another waiver around intern intern inspections. Um, also, that we can waive um, the requirement to conduct the interim inspection and requires an alternate method. Allows for repairs to be verified by alternate methods. So it allows us to verify if someone has completed their repairs um, by self certifying. Um, turnover, so project-based voucher, so allows the project-based voucher turnover units to be filled based on owner certification. There's no life-threatening, so that's something that we would be doing internally. We, we hold those vouchers, and so we would certify that we have um, completed everything, and then we would be, Dave would, would be able to house someone under the RAD program. Um, So we also have a quality control inspection. So this provides a suspension of the requirement for quality control sampling inspections. And we would take that um, waiver as well until the end of the year of 2021. Um, this actually ends in this year in 2021. I know I'm going on and on, I'm sorry, this is so boring. <laughs> um, then the next waiver is uh, waives the requirement for an oral briefing, provides an alternative method to conduct required voucher briefing. So we have been meeting with people over the phone um, and we've been doing 
as much as we can to meet with people over the phone. Um, but this would allow us, if we needed to postpone any of, if like we get behind work, that would allow us a little bit more time. Um, we can allow voucher extensions regardless of current PHA policy. So like if for instance, someone no longer qualified for a voucher, we could still maintain the voucher because they have nowhere to move. And so we will take that voucher as well. Um, approval of assisted tenancy when the HAP contract is executed. This provides payment for the contract and not, so this is, um, so we'll take this waiver. So usually if we don't fill the unit within a certain number of days, we under six, oh, if we don't fill the unit within 60 days, we lose, we don't get paid for it. But this will allow us um, to continue that HAP payment until the contract is executed. We're not really in that position because if we have a unit, we're filling it pretty quickly. <laughs> so, but we're taking it anyway, just in case. Um, I think that might be it. If you could look at this, there's like five. Oh, there's one more. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, and this is an important one. So if we have a unit, so under the HUD guidelines, if we had like a two, a three bedroom unit, we couldn't put someone who only qualifies for a two bedroom unit in it. But under this waiver, we could potentially do that if that was all we had available. So we would move them into what would made the most sense. Is it a project based voucher? Yes, a rad project based voucher. So if we have a unit, let's say we have a one bedroom, we have a two bedroom, but they really only qualify for a one bedroom, like a single mom and a child can qualify for a one bedroom. We could still put them in a two bedroom, even though they would technically only qualify for the one. Does that make sense? That's useful. And, and we might need to do that. <laughs> um, and so the other piece will be HUD will carry forward the most recent. So every year we get a section eight management assessment program we get assessed so they're just going to carry forward our assessment from last year and they're not going to evaluate us for this year and that is last but not least of all the vouchers and there's like i don't know there's got to be a hundred of them here all the waivers so great job christine thank yeah. you well if you need a motion i would i'd be glad to prove <laughs> that we accept your waivers okay so i second approve, we approve your waivers Great, thank you. Favor, please say aye. 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 Well, aye. We are at the end of the regular meeting. Do I hear a motion to end the regular meeting and to go into executive session? I so move. Thank you, Byron. I'll second it. Melissa. All those in favor of ending the regular meeting and going into an executive session, please indicate, saying aye. Aye. 